All right, so we're in the book of Acts. If you want to turn the book of Acts, it's, uh, if you're using the Green Bible, you've grabbed on the way in, it's page 912. Otherwise, you're on your own, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. We're in Acts chapter 6 today. And the book of Acts is all about no matter what we are facing, no matter what we're going through, no matter what our country, what our world, <laughs> can it get any crazier? <laughs> Every, oh, it's just unbelievable. No matter what we're going through, we can still not only survive, but thrive. We can still live in victory through our faith in Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the whole point. They did not have it easy in the book of Acts. As bad as it is for us, it's nothing compared to what the Christians went through in the book of Acts, right? Uh, you know, I've never been shipwrecked or beaten or flogged or beheaded, you know, Apostle Paul, all right? Yeah, we're going to see it all. You know, but, but they, it didn't change their victory. It didn't change their faith. They still had a, a joy that we can only barely glimpse, right? They had this amazing joy. And that's the whole focus of this. No matter how crazy it gets, we can still have that joy. No matter what we're going through, we can still have that peace by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, today we're going to look at how the, uh, the deacons were appointed and the results of appointing the deacons in the book of Acts. And the title is, The Body of Christ Needs You. The Body of Christ Needs You, Acts 6, 1 to 7. And I'm going to start out with a farm story. Bob's, my, Big Bob isn't here. He's going to, I hope you're watching live, Big Bob. I got a farm story for you here. But anyway, my, when my dad... When he, he's, we had cows, milked the cows, and, and when, finally when the boys got old enough, he could then turn over the milking to them sometimes. And, and, and Billy and I were the, the main ones, Billy and Chucky. Uh, we were there, and we were, we'd milk the cows, and that was our job. And, but what would happen is we'd go out and we'd start milking the cows, and my brother Billy would get started milking them, and I would start to tell stories. I'd start to tell stories, I'd start to tell something that I saw on TV or something that happened or, or something with our friends or some cra something, some, I'd just tell stories, I, was, I t would tell stories. And we'd keep milking and Bill would be milking and I'd be telling stories and about an hour and a half later, that's how long it took to milk the cows, uh, it, all of a sudden Bill would be like, on the last couple of cows, he'd go, wait, hey, wait a minute, I did all the milking. You didn't do anything. I go, yes, I did. I told the stories. And, uh, and I, I kept you entertained. We're both happy. I, you're milking, and, and I kept you entertained, and the cows are all milked. But it really was better. It, it, but it didn't matter. The next time we'd start milking, same thing would happen. I'd tell stories, and he milked the cows. But it was better that way. There, it was better because Billy was good at milking cows. I was not good at milking cows. I'm going to tell you right now. I was not a, I was a, a farm boy, but I wasn't a farmer, all right? I made a mess of everything. I couldn't milk the cows. Oh, I could milk them. I could grab them and squirt the milk. You know, ever see the, you grab the cows, uh, you know, privates, and you squeeze it, and you squirt it, and, 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 uh, and I, like my friends would be over, or the cats, I'd squirt the milk to the cats, they'd all be excited, or, or my friends would come over, i go, hey, look, did you ever see how a cow's milk comes out, and they'd come walking up, I, I could shoot 10 feet away, 20 feet away, hit it right in the face, I was really good at milking, but what I wasn't good at was using the machine, the milking machine, and getting all the milk out, because you have to do it just right, if you, if you, if you leave some milk in, it can cause mastitis, but if you milk them too long, it, it stresses their udders, all right? And uh, it's utterly stressful. But I, and, uh, I just came up with that. But anyway, it, it stresses them. So I was not very good at it. When Billy wasn't there, I always made a mess of things. My dad would say, uh, you know, make sure you get all the milk out. A couple of the cows have mastitis and I'm having to treat them. I'm like, okay. I really didn't know what I was doing. I just couldn't get the hang of the milk coming through the tubes. You had to squeeze these tubes and feel, feel the milk coming out. You know what I'm talking about? Are you, the milk coming out. i uh, got a couple farmers here. And, and uh, Ellie, did you ever do the milk, the milk machines? Yeah. <laughs> but but the, you, you'd squeeze it and I just couldn't get the hang of it. So when, when it worked out better, it was better for the cows and everybody involved if I kept Billy happy and he did the milking. It was just better, right? And, and it also not only was good for the cows, but also prepared me for preaching because I was working on my, my stories, right? My stories. And, and my dad still talks about it to this day. He goes, the reason you're, you're good at preaching is because you are telling your stories in your sermons is, is you would come out to the farm. He would still remind me. I was like a little kid, five, six, seven. I'd come out and he'd say, 
I'd watch Leave It the Beaver. I'd get home from school, I'd watch Leave It the Beaver. Any Leave It the Beaver fans? Oh, I know them all, watch them all. And so I'd watch Leave It the Beaver and I'd go right out to the barn and help, help my dad. <laughs> I remember standing there and telling him the story about Leave It the Beaver. I'd go through the whole episode. <laughs> yeah. Now he's probably already had it memorized too, he's watched it, but he's still listening and laughed and you know, acted like he was interested. And he, go, and he still says, it's because you, I let you do all the Leave It the Beaver stories when you came out. So that's our, that's our story thing. But, so where I'm going with this is we're going to see in this book of Acts today, we're going to see that, the, that a, a parallel here with the Holy Spirit appointing hands-on pastors, hands-on deacons is what he appointed. And they appointed these hands-on deacons so that the apostles and the elders could, could teach and, and preach, so they could teach and preach. And the result was that the people were better off, better off. Better off because they were fed two ways. They were gonna see that they're fed physically and they're sp fed spiritually. And that's the same picture. When, when people are doing what they do best, that's when things turn out the best for the church. And that's what we're gonna see here in a little bit. Just like on the farm, same thing here, okay? Let me read the passage, but I'm gonna pray first. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Acts and the encouragement that gives us and, and the power in the book of Acts. And we just pray that, our, that we would hear and our hearts would be changed. And what I really want to pray is that every one of us would really be using our gifts, our spiritual gifts. We would be using them because of this, this passage. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's uh, pick it up here. I think I may be a little close here. Okay, let's pick it up here in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples were, was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of the food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, uh, Prochorus, Nic Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of the God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Wow. So the first thing that jumps out at us is conflict. <laughs> the very first church had Conflict. Very first church in history had conflict. First church ever already has conflict, right? Crazy, right? And look at the fault lines. Look at the fault lines. The different cultures and the growing pains. The growing pains. It's growing. The growing pains and the different cultures. That's the problem, all right? So much of ministry. Yeah, you might have to. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, trying to figure out the whole sound thing. So, so much of ministry, and they don't tell you this in, in, in seminary, so much of ministry is dealing with conflict. Right? Resolve, no, resolving conflict. It's just a constant. If you have children, you know what I'm talking about. You have kids, what are they always doing somehow? Fighting somehow, bickering, fighting. Doesn't matter if you have two or 12, doesn't matter. They're fighting constantly. It's just, it just comes with welcome to the human race, right? And so, so much of ministry is doing that and it gets exhausting sometimes. I gotta admit, it gets exhausting. The one thing when I retire someday is uh, the one thing I won't miss is the fighting, the conflict, resolving conflict, but it has to be done. Pastors have to do it and if they don't do it, if they don't do it, there are, oh, I gotta pull, oh okay. <laughs> We are missing that. I was wondering, I thought, I thought something was different. Is that better? Thank you, Rob. We're gonna be bringing up Rob in just a minute on a couple of things I'm gonna tell you about. So I thought it was popping funny and we didn't have the little padding there. All right, so thank you, thank you. <laughs> he figures everything out. But it has to be done. 
because pastors who ignore it, they, they, they just say, oh, I just, they put their head in the stand, they ignore it. It always comes back to haunt. It has to be done or the church will split. Any church will split if you don't resolve conflicts biblically, the biblical way, very, very important. In fact, churches are always splitting. They're splintering. Did you know that? Churches are constantly splintering. People are getting upset, they leave. They go somewhere else, they get upset there, they leave. You know, there's, it's constant. It's constant and it's so important for churches to, and pastors to keep on helping resolve conflict in a healthy way and keeping people unified in the, in the love of Christ. Very, very important part of ministry, okay? So we have this group that feels neglected and, it, and is causing the, the, the apostles, because they're neglected, they're causing the apostles to neglect their ministry. See that? They feel neglected. They cause, cause the apostles to neglect their ministry. And look what happens in verse 2. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. That was vital for the health of the first church and this church now. The, the health of the first church that the elders focused on teaching the Word of God and prayer. Very, very important. That is a pastor's main job, okay? Yes, as a pastor and, and elders in the church, we're going to talk about that in a few moments, there, they, we have to do a lot of other things too, and we are called to serve for sure, but we can never let anything get in the way of our main focus, and that is the Word of God. Uh, it, it must be the Word of God and prayer. And I'm not talking about being locked away in our office. You know, some guys, oh, I'm not, I know some pastors, I take 30 hours a week on my sermon. You know, I'm like, how much time do you have left for people? You know, I'm not saying, you, you, God bless you, if you can do 30 and 30, that's awesome. But, but, but I'm not talking about, some guys just lock away and they don't talk to the people, don't minister to people. I'm not talking about that. But, but it, it's, it, it's, it's not that, but, but it's the ministry of the Word. And you look at the apostles and their ministry of the Word was for sure they study the scripture. That's very, very important. We can, no pastor can neglect that. No, no, no. Very important. But their ministry of the word was more than just in their office. They didn't have them, obviously. But, uh, but it was more than just that. They, they also were out preaching. They were out teaching. They went house to house in the temple courts. They were with the people. They led prayer meetings. You read the book of Acts, they're always leading prayer meetings. They're involved with the word of God, you know, taking it to the people, doing the evangelism, taking it to the people. That was the, that is the pastor's job, to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, very important to study, but also to take it to the people. And that's what I'm talking about, okay? So what was their solution with this problem? The solution is in verses three and four. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So that was what they did. They appointed seven men, which are going to be called deacons later in the book of Acts and all through the New Testament. These are known as deacons, all right? Seven deacons. Churches have deacons. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. To minister to the material needs to minister to the material needs, all right? And we're gonna see they're called deacons. The word deacon means, uh, it's, it's uh, in Greek it's diakonos, I can't hear because there's this fan blowing here. Diakonos, but it means, I know, some, I know several people said it, uh, but also it means servant, serving, okay, servant. That's what it literally means. Now, these seven men were appointed deacons but, uh, and servants. That's what they're appointed as. But this is not second class ministers. You know? A lot of people think, oh, well, you have your elders, then you have your deacons, you know? No, 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 no. No, deacons, it's not second class. Look at Stephen. Look at Stephen in verse five. Look at this guy. Uh, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man of full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Look, verse eight, verse eight. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Woo, wait till we get to that one in a couple weeks. Uh, that, this, does that sound like a second class pastor to you? A second class, you know, ministry guy? No, he had doing, you know, powerful, powerful. They're not second class. Just, and we, let's look at the qualifications. I'm just gonna use um, our, our church constitution. I know most of you have this memorized, but I'll just read it in case you, uh, in case you forgot part of it. All right, so, <laughs> all right, so uh, listen to this for uh, elders. 
Elders qualification. Elders must be mature, godly men who display the qualifications stipulated by scripture, including 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. Deacons. Deacons must be mature, godly men who display the qualities stipulated by scripture, including 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13. You catch that? There's no difference in our qualifications. And let's look at the scriptural qualifications. In 1 Timothy 3, first of all, the elders, listen to this about the elders here. Here is a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Overseer, elder, inter use interchangeably. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with a proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Okay, that is the qualifications biblically of an elder. Now listen to the deacon right after this, verse eight. Deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. I think we get the point. <laughs> the qualifications, both very spiritual and very similar. There's very, very little difference between them. They both have to be spiritually mature. And it also points out here very clearly that both must be Men, they must be men. First Timothy 2, 11, 13 tells us why they must be men. First Timothy 2, verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent for Adam was formed first, then Eve. First, then Eve. The Bible is very, very clear uh, that, that uh, our con and, uh, listen to our Constitution. I want to read what our Constitution says. Should have read that. First, in our very Constitution, which everybody who's a member here signs and agrees to and affirms, uh, while the New Testament, uh, it says women's ministries. While the New Testament offers no church office for women, it strongly extols and praises the faithful ministry of the women of the church. New Hope Community Church follows this biblical example and wholeheartedly encourages the women of the congregation to enthusiastically pursue ministries which don't compromise the biblical principle of spiritual submission, 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 13, which I, I just read, okay? So uh, very, very clear. Paul, very clear biblical teaching. Paul connects it out. Why? He takes it to creation. It's not because of the fall. It's not because women are inferior. No, no, no. Women spiritually are equal to men, but it's, it's creation's order. God created us to be this way. We all have different roles and responsibilities. Just as Jesus is, is submissive to the Father, uh, same thing. He's not He's equal to the Father, and yet he's, he's given a submissive role to his Father. Uh, the same thing with, with men and women, husbands and wives, men leading in the church. It goes back to creation itself. It's not a put down. It is simply different roles and responsibilities. And it's sad that so many churches, even evangelical churches, are caving in to the culture on such a clear biblical teaching. It's very, very troubling. It's a caving in and, and it's a it's a slippery slope. I've seen churches, denominations, individuals who say, oh, I'm not going to follow that teaching on, on God's word and, and men in, in leadership and ministry and we're going to let women, you know, do whatever men do. It's a, I call it a slippery slope and whenever I see a church doing that, they start down that slippery slope and they always end up at a cliff. They go over a cliff. They start disobeying other things. I, I, I ain't gonna connect the dots, but I've seen amazing ch things that churches have affirmed and, and gone along with, and it started by saying, I don't, I'm not gonna follow God's word on this. 
And next thing you know, they have a woman pastor. And next thing you know, they're affirming all kinds of sinful things because they disobeyed God's clear teaching. Slippery slopes lead to cliffs. If we, and it goes for anything, anything in the God's word that we say, I'm not gonna follow this. I'm not gonna believe that. I know God's word teaches it, but I'm not gonna follow it. Anytime we do that with anything in God's word, that is a slippery slope that ends somewhere with a cliff. And I've seen churches do that. They start with this and they end up in false teaching. It's over, over and over and over again. I've seen it. Uh, it's it slippery slopes lead to cliffs. Very clear that, it, that, that uh, uh, elders and deacons must be men and they must be very, very spiritual. So we see deacons are just as vital as elders. It's not a second class position. It's just a em different emphasis. One, deacons focus on the physical, material needs and, and, and elders focus on the more spiritual needs. And it's important, right? If these, these widows, if they're starving, what, they're, let's say they're starving and they, they don't have enough food to eat. Do you think when the apostles come to feed them spiritually, are they going to listen? <laughs> they're only going to hear their stomachs rumbling, right? You, you, you have to meet people's physical needs. Very, very important. Material needs, very important. Something stressing someone out, trying to help them meet their stressed out needs so that they can receive God's word. Very, very important. Uh, before you feed them spiritually, you have to give them food, right? And look at the results of delegating to the deacons. Verse 7, the results of delegating to the deacons back to uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 7. So because of what they did, delegated, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Look at the result. The disciples increased rapidly as a result of them delegating to the deacons. Why? Because the deacons were meeting the physical needs, which are very important to people, which freed up the apostles, who are the elders, to focus on meeting the spiritual needs. Very, very important. That was the result of, of everybody doing their job their, the right way. And this is exactly what we see at New Hope Community Church. We, we function the same way. Uh, I think of myself and Brian, Brian Shield, who's uh, on staff here, associate pastor, but he's also a, a deacon. And <clears throat> I just, so many times, I just love Brian because what, so many things that, that would take me away from the Word, take me away from my study time, take me away from my prep time, take me away from spending time with people in, uh, in counseling and encouragement and, and using the Word uh, with prayer. Uh, many times I'll, something will come up, a, a need in the church. How many, of, how many of you guys have had Brian help you out or one of the deacons help you out? Many of you, right? And, and I'll just say, Brian, I, this person has a, a, a need. Do you mind? You know, and he, oh, I'm right on. And he calls them and he gets over there and, and he shovels off their car or he shovels their driveway or he, you know, he, you know, whatever it is, there's all kinds of things he does for people constantly. He's constantly doing that. And, and, uh, and he, he meets people's needs. He, he just helps them out fixes something, whatever it is, he's constantly doing that. And it frees me up, and I just love working with Brian because we're such a great team together. And it, those things are important. If he wasn't there to do them, I would have to do them. And, and, and I, you know, I'm treading water as it is, and, and I'm not good at milking cows, right? So I, uh, you, know, I you, know, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I, you want me to fix your car? You want me to do something technical or mechanical? You know, you know, don't let me near your car, right? But Brian's good at that. He's, he's good hands-on stuff. He's good at things. And so that, my only point is he can do things that, that I can't do that frees me up to do what, I, what I'm called to do. Very, very important. And, uh, and it, all of our elders and deacons function the same way, that same way, although there's always lots of overlap. I've shoveled lots of snow you know, and, and uh, done other things. There's lots of overlap, and we're all called to serve. And, and, and many times we have to serve, and maybe we're not good at something. We've still got to roll up our sleeves and do it. Uh, you know what I mean? We, we still have to serve. I remember... Uh, Nancy's house, right? Nancy, she's probably watching this. You know, the, the bee, the tree fell on me and all the bees stinging me. Yeah, so anyway, uh, you know, there's lots of stories there. <clears throat> uh, men's helping hand, they almost helped me to heaven. But anyway, uh, some of you remember that story. But, but all, we all have to serve, but, but it really, the elders and deacons function very well this way. We have elders, my, I'm a, an elder, obviously. Uh, Paul Vandervliet's an elder. And uh, Todd Bunce is an elder. And uh, let's see, that's uh, me, Todd. Those are all the staff. Then Jim uh, Davis 
and Chuck Harrison are all elders. So you, now you know who, you, most of you already know who they are, but, but that, those who, who are looking out for people spiritually and doing a lot of things, but helping out, helping out spiritually. And then deacons, right now we have two. We've had different ones over time, but right now we have two. Uh, Brian, who I already mentioned, and Bob Cunningham is also a deacon. And what, what about Bob, right? What where would we be without Bob? He, he's like that undercover guy who helps so many people, you know, always helping somebody. I know I'm embarrassing him there, but, but always helping someone and, and off, behind the scenes. That's what the deacons often do, behind the scenes, helping people, helping so many people. Uh, and, you know, well, you know, well, Brian and Bob, you know, it's, they're like the offensive linemen, right? Uh, Matt, we're Matt going to go play football here, right? Duquesne leaving next week, right? Uh, you still play offensive lineman, right? Yeah, center, right? He's center, going to play for Duquesne. And, uh, but what, what, what happens? To, do you get a lot of credit being an offensive lineman? When do you get noticed? <laughs> yeah, when someone gets by you, right? When some, you don't do your job. That's the only time the offensive lineman get their credit, right? His, or get any, get any notice is when, you know, it's when they don't do their job. But they're vital. They're so important. There is no football team can function without a great offensive line. And Matt's a great offensive lineman. Uh, he needs to get a little bit bigger, though, I think. Uh, joking. You, know, <laughs> you, ever try, you ever try to move him? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. He's, he's strong. So the, but that's, that's what the deacons are. They're like the offensive linemen. And, and they, they, they meet those needs that let, that they let the, the, the elders do what they need to do. It's very, very vital. And it's not just elders and deacons, but we're all called to serve. Yeah, deacons, diakonos, you know, servants, but we're all called to serve. Jesus said in Mark 10, 30, uh, Mark 10, 30, 40, 10, 43, Mark 10, 43, he said, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. We are all called to serve. We are all called to be slaves to Jesus. We're called to serve. We're called to, to, to be sacrificial. We're all called to that. And not only that, not only are we called to serve, but we have an all been given spiritual gifts the moment you put your faith in Jesus, the moment you say, God, I believe Jesus died for my sin. I repent of that sin. I put my faith in Jesus, his death on the cross for me, his resurrection from the dead. I put my faith in him for my forgiveness and a new life in Jesus. I give my life to Jesus. The moment you put your faith in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit brings something along with him. He brings spiritual gifts. He actually energizes you with gifts. And I'm not talking about talents. Talents are very important. We're called to use our talents. Remember Jesus, what Jesus said about talents? Don't bury your talents, right? Use them. Use them to multiply them. We, we are all given talents in life that we're called to use for God's glory and to use in the church, in the body of Christ. But in addition to our natural talents, supernatural talents that God gives us naturally, we also are given supernatural spiritual gifts that, that we get at salvation and they're there waiting for us to, in the spirit, to use those gifts. That's what, that's what we, we're called to use. And we, but we have to find out what those gifts are and we have to use those gifts in the body of Christ. Very, very important. Romans 12, there's several gifts of, several lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible. I'm just gonna read one of them. Romans 12, verse four. Romans 12, verse four. And here's one list thing. There's lots of them. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. And if it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. And that's just one of the lists of gifts, and there's several in the, in the New Testament. But, but it's vital for all of us to find our gifts and to use our gifts. Very, very important. And a lot of people say, ah, it's no big deal if I'm not at church or if I, I don't serve in my church or I don't get involved in my, my small group or, or something, you know, in the community. You know, it's no big deal. It is. Well, I'm just a toe. Some people say, I, it's, I don't, I'm not that gifted. I, I'm just, well, 
What if you don't, you know, just, let's say it's just, you're just a big toe. Well, what's the big deal? How about taking off your big toe and see how big a deal it is? Think you won't miss your big toe? Yeah. You'll miss any part of your body. You'll miss it, you know? Uh, we, we're all, it doesn't matter what part of the body we are. We are vital, and when you're not there, we're missed. It's very, very important that we, we all use our gifts. And the same thing goes for the talents. Jesus talked about the talents, that we have to use them. If we don't use them, he takes them away, right? We're, we're called to use them to multiply. I, are you using your gifts and talents? It's so important. I'll just use Rob. Rob was just walking up here fixing my mic, you know? Uh, you know, Rob France, he came back to our church in the middle, uh, toward the end of the COVID pandemic. And can you, can you imagine if Rob wasn't here now? I just think about this all the time. What if God hadn't led Rob and Lisa back to our church just at this time? Where would we, where would we be, right? Where would we be? I, I, I can't even Im imagine it. He knew we needed his gifts and talents for our post-COVID church. Look how things have changed in all the churches. What if, we, what if God hadn't led Rob here? And, and the result of him using his talents, you see the cameras and the, the, you know, the computers and his team, he's got a great team that works with him and he's got more people he's leaning on working on getting more. And, and it's just, um, and I know how much Todd appreciates him, but <clears throat> it, it's, w more people are now watching live stream that watch live. Lots of people are watching live stream and, and, and they're growing spiritually. Maybe they can't be here. Maybe they live too far away. Uh, hi, Linda. Live far away. Uh, but, you know, they live far away, but, but or, or they just aren't quite ready to come into the church yet. You know, you know they're just dipping their toe in the water. But it's it, the, the fruit of, of not just our service here and making this happen, which I can't imagine. We're it being in a new location with the sound issues and all that. What he's done here is incredible. But also what getting it out to the to, to people. We, I get emails, people getting saved. Never been in our church. They're saved. They're growing. They're like, I'm going to be there someday. Watch for me. You know, they're, they're growing. It's all, it, God, if God is using so many people here, by just using Rob as an example, that that if, if God hadn't brought Rob here, I just don't know what we would do. You know, I really don't. And, and, and that's how God works. Every one of you has an important part of the body of Christ. Every one of you is very, very important. What part of the church body are you? Do you know? If you're not sure yet, then just start serving. Start serving because what happens is you just dive in. You know, I tell people, just go work in the nursery. Go do this. Go do that. Do something because as you do it, you're serving, which is good, but also gifts start to rise to the top. You start to recognize your gifts and you start to see how God energizes you with certain things and, and, and brings fruit so, through certain things. And it's so important. If you, if you are not, if you have not found your gifts and if you're not using your gifts and talents in the body of Christ, then you are holding us back from reaching our God-given purpose and potential. We will not reach our potential until you are functioning with your talents and found in using your spiritual gifts. Very, very important. I'm not saying it to beat anybody up. I'm just saying, let's get going. We gotta find them. We gotta use them. We gotta, we, gotta, we gotta do that. Do you know what your gifts and talents are? Start serving. They'll start to become clear. But, but your best, I always tell everybody, your best ability is your availability. Your best ability is, is our best ability is our availability, right? And, and so to help you get going, I've talked to Paul and Joy Vanderbilt, de delegated, delegating, right? I talked to Paul and Joy, and they, they have, they've got a spiritual gifts inventory. And they're gonna, whoever wants to meet with them, fill out the spiritual gifts inventory, figure out, because these inventories kind of give you some indication of what your gifts might be, what your talents might be, and then they'll help you figure that out biblically and then help you find ways to serve. It might be here in our church, it might be in a home fellowship, it might be in youth group, it might be uh, an outreach ministry, it might be some, starting a new ministry somewhere in our community. It might be all kinds of things, but figuring out where your gifts are and, and using them, very, very important. So Paul and Joy, give away, where's Paul and Joy? Give away back there. Are you, most of you all know Paul and Joy. And, uh, 
And also, Paul will be up here praying afterward if anybody wants to come up and pray. Uh, he always brings the team up. So if you have special needs after every service, if you have special needs, he's always up here with his team of people and uh, up here praying. And Sean Davis is often up here and different people up here, Chuck Harrison up here. Whoever wants to be part of it, come on up. But if you want prayer, they're always up here, okay? So anyway, the point is we need every Christian here. Every person who's hearing this, it's vital. We need you here. It's great you can watch live streams. Some of you can't be here, but if you can be here, we do need you here. We need you here. We need you using your gifts here at church in your home, a home fellowship or a small group, some kind of group beyond this, because this is awesome, but, but the small groups is where we can really, you know, challenge each other and encourage each other and help each other. Uh, you know, some kind of small group, some kind of, you know, one-to-one -one discipleship, something. We, some kind of outreach. We need you in, in, in the outreaches. Somewhere, you, 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 you know, ministering outside the church, all kinds of different things we do. We're all needed. Listen, there is no such thing, and this is pretty deep here, there's no such thing as a tonsil Christian. Do you know where I'm going with this? I remember, anybody get their tonsils out? Back in the day, everybody got them out. Remember, now they don't take them out. Your kids are going to be in the hospital, they don't care. They won't take the tonsils out. I'm like, take the tonsils out. They won't take them out. But, but uh, they, they don't take them out anymore, but back when I was a kid, they took him out. I think I was five. I remember getting him out. I was about five years old, and I remember going to the hospital. The doctor says, you got to, remember, he said, you got to get your tonsils out. I always had a sore throat and all that. So I go to the hospital, and my mom, you know, leaves me at the hospital, and, and uh, I remember being there, and the nurse came in, and she says, okay, now we got to put you to sleep. We're going to give you some medicine, and uh, so they're going to give me the medicine, and, and she gave me the medicine, and Anyway, it's a suppository, but I still remember that too. But anyway, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, but I remember saying to the nurse, <laughs> that, you know, the kids can't swallow pills, right? So anyway, the, 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 the so anyway, she says, now you're gonna fall asleep. And I remember saying, no, I'm not. And she goes, yeah, yeah, you're gonna fall asleep because we're gonna do this here. I'm not falling asleep. I remember the nurse there. I, I'm not falling asleep. She goes, oh, you'll fall asleep. No, I'm not. Everybody else, I, I remember, I, I am not going to sleep. I remember sitting there, you know, not going to sleep. She was just smiling. Next thing I woke up, she was still smiling. And I, my throat hurt, you know, and she said, you want some ice cream? You know, that's the last thing I remember. But, but, but the thing was, they took my tonsils out. Yeah, I got ice cream. That was awesome. For about a week, I got to eat ice cream. But I, uh, I didn't miss them. I didn't miss them. They were, they were gone because tonsils, they're not sure what they do. And when you get them cut out, you don't miss them. Right? Isn't it true? But there's no such thing as a tonsil Christian. <laughs> yeah, so many people think they function. There's no such thing. We're all needed in the body of Christ. There, so many Christians don't get that. So many, uh, nobody here, but people not here. Uh, anyway, uh, so many phantom limbs, phantom limbs. I'm a, a big history buff, you know, and, and, and with, I remember reading about the Civil War stories, but oh, it's terrible stories. Back then they didn't have the technology and the antibiotics and all that. So if anybody got shot in the arm, what'd they do to the arm? Cut it off. Terrible. They didn't have, they didn't have anything to put them to sleep either, you know. They, they cut the arms off. Oh, terrible sort of legs off. Cut it off, you know. Everything just came off, you know. And, and the crazy thing, it was so much pain they went through. But then after it was cut off, guess what they still felt? They still felt pain. They'd wake up and they'd say, oh, good, you didn't have to take my arm off. But boy, does it hurt, doctor. And he'd say, uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's no arm. They still felt the pain. And then later on, after they healed, if they survived, only about half of these people survived losing a limb. limb. Uh, after that, they could still feel their arm would itch or they still get pain. And there's nothing they could do about it because the limb was gone and they would go to use their arm. They just naturally, that's what they would go to do and they couldn't use it. And so many Christians are phantom limbs. They're phantom limbs. The, the body of Christ, they, they cause some pain. <laughs> and they, you know, they, they cause pain. Uh, I'm just kind of joking. But, but, uh, you know, but when they show up, they don't, they're not there. They don't, you know, they're not using their gifts. They're not part of the body of Christ. They're, they're, they're not fully there. And it's very important as Christians that we're not tons we realize we're not tonsil Christians. There's, there's way too many phantom limbs out there. 
We are all, you are needed, vitally needed, very, very important. And maybe you don't have a spiritual gift yet because you've never received the gift. You've never received the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. You've never received the gift of salvation. That's when you get it. And you must take that first step, putting your faith in Jesus Christ to get your gift. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you ever believed in Jesus Christ? The word believe in the Greek means to put your faith and your trust and to completely depend on. Has there ever been that time in your life where you said, God, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he died for my sin. I repent of those sins. Whatever you've done in the past can be gone the moment you pray the prayer of faith. It's gone in God's sight. You're forgiven. It's wiped out. Sure, we got to struggle with the consequences, but, but in God's sight, it's gone. It is gone. Have you ever put your faith, ask God to forgive your sins, repented of the sins, put your faith in Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for us. We put our faith in his death, his resurrection. We put our total trust in him and give our life to him. Have you ever done that? The moment you do that, you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive spiritual gifts, and you're on an adventure. Let me tell you, you're on an adventure. But that's the first step. Let's pray. As we go to this time of prayer, I want to start with maybe you're here and you've never received the gift of life through Jesus Christ by putting your faith in him. You don't have spiritual gifts because you still need to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit by faith. You can do that right now, whether you're here or whether you're listening, watching, wherever you are, you can do that this very second. The simple but powerful prayer of faith. God, I repent of my sin. I don't want the garbage in my life anymore, the shame anymore. I walk away from it. I turn away from it. I ask you to forgive me. Whatever we have done, God's word says he will take it as far as the east is from the west, if we will ask him to forgive us. And we put our faith, God, I put my faith in Jesus. His death and resurrection for me. His payment for my sins on that cross. I put my faith in Jesus. I give my life to him. And while we're praying about that, maybe you've already done that, but you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But are you using your spiritual gifts? Have you found them? Are you using them? Are you fulfilling your purpose and your spiritual potential? Will you commit to doing that? Father, I pray that our local church body here would reach its potential, that each person would, would be growing spiritually and be being filled with the Spirit and would be, would be finding our gifts and using them, not falling back, not backsliding, but moving forward, moving our church forward. And I pray that every person who hears this would put their faith in Jesus and receive the gift of salvation, the gift of your Holy Spirit. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have put your faith in Jesus today, I want to encourage you to tell somebody. Maybe you're here with a family member or a friend or tell me on the way out or email or call or text me or somebody. Let somebody know today. Don't let the day go without letting someone know so that we can encourage you and be excited for you.
And also, if you're sitting there thinking, I haven't found my gifts yet, and I need, I need God's help with that, uh, once again, Paul and Joy are ready with the, with the little tests to take, little inventories to take, and, and get you plugged in, okay? All right, God bless. Thanks, and uh, don't forget next week, Josh will be here, and uh, we'll just close up with uh, worship.